You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. My name is Simon Rusnak. The ARC, the ARC Ensemble, is the resident musical group at the prestigious Royal Conservatory's Glenn Gould School in Toronto. Comprised of senior faculty and guest artists, their commercial recordings have garnered international praise, awards, and acknowledgments. Dedicated to the discovery of hitherto unknown masterworks, the latest in their Music in Exile series features the, the chamber works of Ukrainian Jewish composer Dmitry Klebanov. And to learn more, we've reached ARC Ensemble Artistic Director Simon Weinberg. Hello and welcome back to Winnipeg's Classic 107. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure to be here. Uh, well, when we last had you on, um, you were by to discuss uh, the works of, of Walter Kaufman, a composer with a unique connection to our city, serving as Absolutely. the first conductor of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. No such connection, I don't think, with Dmitry Klebanov, is there? No, he, <clears throat> I don't think he ever left. Um, uh, he never left the Soviet Union, so yeah. no, no connection. And, but and on, the subject, on the subject of Kaufman, I'm happy to report that um, some of his music is actually going to be in print again. So, um, oh wow, which is so, great. Which is so great. we're really we're really seeing the results of your efforts. And uh, as as you say, Klebanov, um, you know, a, a name you'd be hard pressed to find in a, a music history textbook. Uh, can you start off by telling us briefly a, a, a bit about the composer born in Kharkiv in, in northeastern present day Ukraine in in 1907? Um, <clears throat> well. Um, I have to say, to begin with, I'm, I am not by any means an expert on Soviet music. Um, so this was really a little bit out of my comfort zone, but the music was just so extraordinary that I felt, you know, we had no option. We had to, we had to look at it. Um, <clears throat> so, it, I mean, in terms of uh, who he was and what he did, he, um, you know, he, he lived through a really, tricky time, I would say, not to mention dangerous and, um, and, and perilous, certainly for a Ukrainian. Um, so he, he was born in 1907, his family was not particularly musical, but he showed extraordinary gifts as a, as a, as a kid. And um, he started learning the violin when he was quite young and um, made, it seems, astonishing progress. Um, and uh, thing, things were going well. He, you know, he he graduated from the local uh, conservatory, and he he was writing music. Um, but things kind of ran afoul when he finished his first symphony, and that was just after the Second World War. He'd come back from Tashkent in Uzbekistan, where a lot of people uh, fled uh, during the war, and. Uh, he came back and he he wrote this symphony dedicating it to the martyrs of Babiya, which is where something like 34,000 Jews were shot um, in a uh, ravine just outside Kiev, or just, just outside the center of Kiev. Um, so he dedicated it to these um, so-called martyrs of, of Babiya, and the piece enjoyed huge success to begin with. But then it was submitted for a Stalin Prize in 1949, I think, 40, it's around about that time. And um, the, uh, the Union of Composers and the Soviet authorities hit the roof. And the, the idea that he was selecting Jews rather than general Soviet citizens really bugged them. And he, so he was used as a kind of an example of what not to do as a Soviet composer. Mm -hmm. And he lost his job. He had been um, head of the uh, Composers Union in, in, um, in Kharkiv. And so all this was taken away from him. And it took him a while before he could recover and get his position back um, or his, uh, his uh, authority and um, influence back. And that, that took quite some time. And um, the uh, you know he he played this he had to play this game like most Soviet composers where you were you were, you were kind of trying to do what you wanted to do, but you also had to do what uh, the powers that be were required of you were required you to do. And so um, when we first looked at Klebanov's works, one well, of the first pieces that the gang read through was uh, his piano quintet. Which, um, which commemorates the 300th anniversary of the um, Treaty of Periaslav, which basically 
it was basically Russian take, Russia taking over Ukraine. And it's an absolutely ghastly work. It's really terrible <laughs> um, because he was writing it, uh, you, you know, for no other reason than money and um, because he, he'd been commissioned to write it. And you can imagine this uh, Ukrainian who was a, an independent, wanted an independent Ukraine and didn't like the idea that you know Ukraine was being pulverized by uh, by the you know the by Moscow he 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 he, he was really a um, he he wanted an independent U Ukraine and so to, to have to write this piece which commemorated Soviet you know the Russian takeover of, of the Ukraine was uh, was something that he you know he did with gritted teeth and when you listen to this thing you can see that he's really um, he, he's kind of taking the mickey actually because it's so bombastic and mm. so bad that he's having a, he's always having a good time writing it oh boy well you know i mean as you say he he lived during um a tricky, that's a good way of putting it, tricky, perilous time in the, in the 20th century. Um, a composer who, who suffered from this, this intense censorship that you were just telling us about, um, both due to that, that Soviet era cultural suppression, but also um, overt anti-Semitism. And, and one of countless near forgotten, rarely performed individuals. I, I guess this next question is a sort of a, a two-parter. The first is, how did you come to learn of Klebanov's music? Because as, as you say, I mean, it, it's, it's tough music to, to find and discover. But then what ultimately made you want to record and then share this music with, with the rest of the world? Um, well, there is a bit of his, there, there is some of it, some of your stuff online. You know, we, you know, we, we see these people as being um, completely unknown, but it's, it's really, they're completely unknown because no one's, spent any money you know on public relations and and making recordings and yeah, yeah, putting yeah. on concerts so um but you know it's not as though they're not there and yeah. if you go on youtube you'll find you know odds and ends and there's a kind of iffy recording of his first symphony and um i think what what's what guided me to him in the first instance was the fact that i had read about this Baba Yar symphony and I thought, oh, you know, he kind of, this kind of fits under our mandate, someone who's suppressed for, um, you know, doing what he wanted to do um, and kind of skirting the authorities. And so that, that draw, drew me to the uh, idea in the first instance. And then when I uh, looked into his music and we got some of the chamber music to, to read, um, and we did a, a Claire Barnoff concert and, um, yeah, the, the the general feeling was was very positive, and you know, have to wheel these things out first to make sure that um, other people are as enthusiastic as as you are. And did, I also read that you had had the help of of Dmitry Klebanov's son. Is 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 that correct as well? Yeah, um, that was very curious. I, I knew someone in I know someone in Israel, and um, they somehow had a connection to. Um, Klebanov's grandson, who, uh -huh. who lived in Israel, and then through the grandson, I I got to know that um, his son was 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 around, um, and so um, I connected with him, uh, Yuri Klebanov, and he was he was really excited and helpful, and um, he sent me all sorts of things, scans and um, you know scores that he had. Um, because no one had really looked at any of Klebanov's stuff for quite some time. So, um, it, you know, everything was going wonderfully. And then in March this year, suddenly there was radio silence and I heard nothing more from him. And I knew that he'd been, he'd been a little ill, but he had written to me and said, you know, I'm feeling really good now and things are going well. And, and then I discovered um, from his daughter that um, he had died on the 28th of March of COVID. So that was um, that was really um, that, that you know kind of hit us all because um, he he was, he was he, I'd never met him but you know from our conversations and um, exchanges on email he was he was he was one, you know one of these really cultured his English was fantastic and he was a really cultured and funny um, and um, yeah, just wonderful wry sense of humor. And you know, suddenly he wasn't there anymore. And the record came out without him having heard the you know the end result. So um, that was uh, that was awful. So we 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 dedicated the record to his memory. He was a, a really lovely man.
Yeah, I, I'm really sorry to hear that. And what a cruel twist of fate, as you say, before the, the record comes out yeah. um, to, to hear the, the music of his father. If you're just tuning in, my name is Simon Rosnack. You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. And I'm chatting with uh, Simon Weinberg, ARC Ensemble Artistic Director. We're chatting about their brand new disc that features the music of Dmitry Klebanov. Um, now, uh, Simon, I do want to chat a little bit about the, the music itself. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no piano quintet on here, though now I need to go <laughs> search it up as uh, you know, you're telling us a little bit about how he was writing music um, to uh, appease the Soviet critics and authorities. Um, not unlike another fellow, Dmitry Shostakovich, who also wrote mm -hmm. music with, with Babi Yar uh, in mind in Symphony Number no. 13. Um, and, uh, you know, the music on this disc uh, shows Klebanov's progression from this very charming, accessible, romantic writing, the, the string quartet number four and the piano trio number two, to the more adventurous and, and spiky, I think that's how you call it, the, the, the quartet number uh, five, which is almost Shostakovich-esque at, at, at times, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, and shades of Prokofiev as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and th I, th that's what I wanted to do with the, the, the three pieces is, is kind of show the uh, progression from, you know, so there's sort of 10 year intervals between each piece. That's not to say that he couldn't have written the fifth string quartet, you know, 10 years earlier but I don't think he would have been, you know, as comfortable writing it then. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it is fascinating that, that uh, uh, when, he, when he got to the, um, the, the, final, um, the final work in the program, that's the, the fifth uh, quartet, when you hear that piece, um, you, you think, well, this is, this is really quite a progression from, from the early, from the early work, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there, there, there's there's something about it that um, that sort of expresses a, a feeling that he suddenly had as the sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the the he could write what he wanted. He you know, he wasn't it, it, he wasn't going to get shot or, or or put in jail for it. You know, he might might be just marginalized and forgotten, and no one would take any notice of it. But you know, he, he could write with impunity. And, that, you know, that was the, the 70s, I guess. Um, you know, do what you want, but, but don't bother us, basically. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is um, a, a fascinating listen, um, right from the first track until the end. And I think what is so impressive about this series, the Music in Exile series, is as you say, there are results. Not only are, are you giving us at a classical music radio station new content to play with composers who, as, as you say, don't get the limelight very often at all, but then there's further results. You're, you're, you're um, sharing the repertoire with other players and music going back to reprint, like the Kaufman we talked about right at the beginning. Yep. Um, you know, Simon, I, I am really curious. You do such a magnificent job uh, with, with all these Music in Exile recordings. Do you have any inkling where you might go next? Like, where, where do you oh, go after this? I, I have I have every idea of where we're going next. <laughs> I've got the next two, um, um, the... Uh, the next two uh, recordings lined up. The um, uh, we're doing we're recording one this December, and um, and then we have another one scheduled for December two thousand and twenty-two. So, oh, so you, you know exactly where you're going. Uh, well, yeah, for well for the next two years, I know where we're going. After that, it's a bit of a question mark. But you, you know, there's um, one of the things. One of the one of the good things about the um, um, the uh, the pandemic was that it, it did give me quite a bit of time to sort of sit down and go through stuff that I haven't looked at for, mm -hmm. for years. Um, and, you know, the things that you kind of pass over and you, you wonder whether they they were worth looking at, and then you come back to them and you, you kind of have a different take on them. Um, so we have a couple of really interesting couples. The next one I, um, we're doing is um, a composer who's actually uh, used Sephardic melodies for as the basis of most of his works, wow. and um, and although his vocal material is fairly, it's pretty well known amongst some singers anyway, and it's been recorded as that, but his instrumental music is completely unknown, mm. um, and most of it wasn't published, and it's really fascinating stuff. So I'm looking forward to that one. Oh, well, we'll just have to keep tuned. Um, Simon, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me at uh, Classic 107 today. Thank you, Simon. Pl real pleasure.